Our next presenter is Dr. Francois Clement Bidard of the Institut Curie in Paris, who will present GS309, Circulating Tumor Cells Driven Choice of First Line Therapy for ER Positive HER2 Negative Metastatic Breast Cancer, Overall Survival Analysis of the Randomized STIC CTC Trial. Thank you very much. I first would like to thank the organizing committee for having selected our work for our presentation. So today, on, the, on behalf of my course, uh, it is my pleasure to present you the result of the overall survival analysis of the phase three stick CTC trial. It was a trial in which we used circulating tumor cell count as a driver to drive the choice uh, for between uh, endocrine therapy and chemotherapy uh, in first line for HIV plus to negative metastatic breast cancer. Disclosures here. So as a background, when it comes to the treatment choice between chemotherapy versus endocrine therapy in HIV plus to negative metastatic breast cancer, we all know that guidelines advocate in favor of choosing endocrine therapy as a preferred therapy because of their uh, very little side effect. But also, chemotherapy could be seen as an option for patients with aggressive disease and unfavorable prognosis. We have no validated decision-making algorithm uh, that could help us to drive that choice, and it leads to highly heterogeneous treatment decision between physicians, centers, and countries. Uh, in terms of uh, regarding circulating tumor cell count, we know it is a standardized liquid biopsy biomarker, which is FDA clear and could be run in clear labs. High CTC count has been shown by our group and others as a level of even dense one adverse prognostic factor, whatever the line of therapy. We know it has a strong impact on PFS and a stronger impact on overall survival. We also know that it complements and not duplicates standard clinical pathological prognostic factors. So in the STIC CDC, the concept was to use CTC count as an aid to choose between endocrine therapy or chemotherapy in HIV plus to negative metastatic breast cancer. The design pre- and post-menopausal women uh, were about to be treated uh, as, as in first line for HIV plus to negative metastatic breast cancer, and these women could have received either endocrine therapy or chemotherapy according to the investigator. Before randomization, we assessed what was the uh, preferred investigator choice, whether it was endocrine therapy, and I will refer to this patient as a, a clinical low patient, or chemotherapy, clinical high patient. We also collected for all patients a CTC count at central platforms. Then, patients were randomized one-to-one -one between the two study arms. In the standard arms, the uh, um, CTC count remained blinded and patients were treated according to the investigator choice. So they received either endocrine therapy or chemotherapy according to the investigator. In the CTC arm, we simply dismissed the investigator choice and patients were treated with, uh, according to the CTC count. Patients were to be treated with endocrine therapy in case of a low CTC count, chemotherapy in case of a high, more aggressive disease, so reflected by a high CTC count. Uh, more than 750 patients have been enrolled at 17 sites in France. The primary objective was, was the, let's say, the short-term um, progression-free survival, and it was a non-inferiority objective, has been already reported and achieved with flying colors. In this final analysis, so it is my pleasure to present you the final data and updated PFS data with about 90% maturity, but also final OS data at a 50% maturity and very important pre-planned subgroup analysis on PFS and OS. So patient characteristics first. So um, we had to assess what was the favorite treatment according to a clinician. So uh, 70. 3% of patients uh, uh, had endocrine therapy favored by investigators, and 27% uh, of patients had chemotherapy favored by investigators. You can note on top here that uh, this uh, treatment decision by investigators was associated with performance status, bone-only disease status, and endocrine resistance status. Then we assess the CTC count in all patients, and you can see that about 62% of patients uh, had a low CTC count, and about 38% of patients had a high CTC count. So CTC count was associated with uh, patient performance status, but was not associated with bone-only disease status, not with endocrine resistance status. 
In terms of allocated therapies, so patients randomized in the standard arm received endocrine therapy or chemotherapy according to clinical choice. So uh, once the allocated treatment type was known, whether it was endocrine therapy or chemotherapy, investigators were free to decide which endocrine therapy or chemotherapy to use. In our patient and in our trial, endocrine therapy mostly consisted in single agent aromatase inhibitor or fulvestran. Of note, it is very important to remind that CDK46 inhibitors were not approved at time of accrual. So, which means uh, this trial and our results do not apply to the choice between chemotherapy and first line aromatase inhibitor plus CDK46 uh, inhibitors. So, however, 42% of patients receive CDK46 inhibitors as second line therapy with no difference between the two arms. When it comes to chemotherapy, it mostly consisted in paclitaxel and uncapcitabine, which are very standard agents. So if you look at the two arms, overall, if you consider the general population, um, you can observe that we had slightly more patients assigned to chemotherapy in the CTC arm, so an increase of uh, 10%. So before moving to the results, first I have to uh, show you the, uh, what are the subgroups we analyzed. We, you have to remember that uh, in our trials, so we could have concordant estimate between clinician and CTC counts. So uh, here you see that about half of patients had concordant favorable estimates, and about 13% of patients had concordant unfavorable estimates. So these patients, clinical low, CTC low, a patient received endocrine therapy in both arms, and a clinical high CTSCI patient received chemotherapy in both arms. So which we have a core population, 60% of the overall population of patients in which the CTC count just confirmed the uh, clinical opinion. What is mostly interesting is also we have these 40% of patients in whom we observe a discordance between the investigator choice and the CTC count, so which means treatment differ between arms. Clinical low CTC high patients received endocrine therapy when allocated to the standard arm and received chemotherapy if allocated to the CTC arm and vice versa for the clinical high and CTC low subgroups, so which prompted us to pre-plan subgroup analysis according to the uh, four subgroups that are shown here. So here is the result of the trial in terms of the general population. Again, I would like to remind you that we have a core population of 60% of patients that receive the same treatment in both arms. So uh, we observe no difference in terms of progression-free survival. This was previously reported, and we can confirm that with a, a later uh, more data. But in terms of overall survival, again, you can see a slight uh, numerical but non-statistically significant uh, improvement in favor of the CTC arm. So non-inferiority was previously demonstrated for PFS. And with longer follow-up, we are further substantiating that CTC-based choice is safe, which is important. It's only one biomarker that is driving the choice of treatment. Now, let's move to the pre-specified subgroup analysis. Clinical low CTC low patient, about half of the patient population. As you can see, similar outcomes because they receive the similar treatments. So they receive endocrine therapy as first line uh, in the two arms. But you can note, however, that the median overall survival was of about five years to the, uh, for this patient who did not receive CDK46 as uh, first line therapy. So it highlights the prognostic impact of uh, CTC count. The other subgroup uh, with no treatment change was the clinical high CTCI subgroup, so a smaller subgroup, 13% of patients, with chemotherapy being given to patients, uh, uh, so in the standard arm, but also in the CTC arm, so shorter uh, progression-free survival and shorter overall survival as well. So let's move to a uh, most important subgroup, which is the clinical low CTC high uh, subgroup. It accounts for 25% of the patient population, one patient out of four, were to be treated by endocrine therapy according to the clinician, and because of a high CTC count, were treated with chemotherapy in the CTC harm. So we previously reported a superiority in terms of progression-free survival in favor of chemotherapy in this patient population. Now again, with a longer follow-up and more event, we can uh, further confirm this. But what is the most important finding of our trial is that uh, this advantage also translates into a statistically significant and clinically meaningful survival benefit in terms of overall survival. We had a difference in the, between the median overall survival uh, between the two arms of 16 months, and the hazard ratio, as you can see here, is 0.53 with a p-value of 0.001. 
last subgroup, clinical high CTC low. So for whatever reason, the clinician thought that chemotherapy would be better for these patients. And uh, because of a low CTC count, patients could have re received uh, endocrine therapy uh, if allocated in the CTC arm. So here we are showing no su survival benefits in terms of PFS and OS of chemotherapy over endocrine therapy. So conclusion is uh, endocrine therapy must remain standard of care in this uh, patient population. Uh, in regards to other subgroup analysis, I'm going to skip that, but treatment, uh, was very con treatment effect was very consistent across all other pre-specified subgroup. So to conclude, the STIC CTC is a first prospective trial to support with a high level of evidence the clinical utility of CTC count in HR plus uh, to negative metastatic breast cancer. The primary objective was previously reached and now with long-term follow-up, we substantiate a major overall survival benefit uh, with chemotherapy in the clinical low CTC high patient with a delta median overall survival of 16 months. Clinical high CTC low patient on the clean therapy must remain standard of care. Main limitation, again, this trial was run in first line but without CDK416 inhibitors. And here, to be really clear, I must insist that CDK416 inhibitors plus endocrine therapy must remain standard of care for CDK416 inhibitor naive patients. However, having said that, the dilemma, as you all know, remains between endocrine therapy and chemotherapy in patients who previously received CDK4-6 inhibitor either as adjuvant or first-line therapy. So overall, uh, I think that our results are bringing new opportunities in the post-CDK4-6 inhibitor setting. We have seen, and it has been very, uh, fairly discussed earlier this morning, that we have short PFS with targeted endocrine therapy and that vectorized chemotherapy like ADC is likely to become a very attractive option in the next few years to come. So we'll have to make tough choice and for that we'll need many biomarkers so which could be predictive biomarkers, ESR1, HER2 low, but here CTC count as a prognostic biomarker, it's a single assessment before therapy, could be used as a standardized biomarker to find patients with aggressive disease. I would like to thank you for your attention and I acknowledge patients, their family, investigators and our funding bodies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Bedard, for your presentation. We now have time for questions from the audience. Is that a question at uh, microphone three? No? Okay. All right. Well, um, I mean, as you pointed out, your study was designed before CDK4-6 inhibitors had become the standard of care. And of course, we've seen even presented earlier at this meeting uh, that the combination of endocrine therapy and CDK4-6 inhibition uh, was superior to first-line uh, combination chemotherapy. Uh, so you know, I guess the question is, how, how are we going to integrate uh, measuring CTCs in terms of making a decision between those first-line therapies? Well, so again, our results do not apply to the treatment choice between chemo and first line in CDK46 naive patients, so to be really clear. Mm -hmm. But we are facing tough choices in second line or later, and soon we'll also have patients who may relapse after adjuvant CDK46. So what would you do in a patient with an air 2 low status, uh, ESR1 mutation, and, uh, but some, still some symptoms, and you, you will feel, you could feel more comfortable with more biomarker. Mm -hmm. We have a bunch of predictive biomarker, but still the median PFS could be very is still very short, and Fabrice André clearly highlighted that we need to have very long PFS in second line, and currently it's not satisfactory. So I anticipate that the place where we could use CTC would be mostly after CDK46, and it could be in first line, uh, since CDK46 are now moving to the adjuvant setting. Thank you. Uh, microphone four. Oh, thank, thank you so much. I pre Andy Stiebel, California. Appreciated this um, presentation. I used to use CTCs all the time in the olden days um, to help direct treatment choices. However, then that option was taken away from us because of other studies that showed that there was no value. 
Do you have any information or will you, following CTCs on those patients that had the OS with chemotherapy change, following the CTCs, if they go up again, will you change chemotherapy? Are, are, do you have that or will you be following that at all? Well, uh, I'm sorry, you know, we, we, we have not such data. Again, this was a single assessment prior to uh, uh, first-line therapy. Um, yeah, so we, CTC were initially proposed, this biomarker was initially proposed to uh, look at the treatment efficacy while the treatment was, has just been started, so early changes. And I'm afraid to say that that strategy has failed mostly to demonstrate a clinical utility. So here it's really something that is different. So um, single assessment as and the clinical utility as a prognostic marker to assess like the prognosis of a patient and tailor what is the best choice of therapy rather than monitoring the efficacy of the therapy. But thank okay. you very much. Thank you again, Dr. Bedard.